The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Australian Retirement Trust, ABN 60905 115 063, AFSL number 228975 and is limited to publicly available information. General advice may be provided by our sponsor, but does not take into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's trusted by over 4,000 advisors and more than 2 million members. With over $200 billion in retirement savings, they have the size and scale to seek out world-class investment opportunities that others may miss and are committed to working with advisors to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include super savings and Q Super FUM and members at June 2022. Hello and welcome back to this series on the art of building trusted relationships. Now, trust is an unconscious feeling which is felt by somebody and building trust is complicated. And thanks to the research in this episode number three of our four-part series, we hear from our panel of speakers on the third area of trust, reliability. Let's get into it. Welcome back to this, the third episode in our series on the art of building trust. Uh, I'm joined again by Andrew. Welcome back. Oh, great to be here. Thanks, Fraser. Thank you for being here. Now, we're talking about reliability in this episode. Uh, let's kick it off. Uh, what are the traits and what should advisors be looking at when it comes to reliability? So re- reliability, again, is part of that authenticity, that repeatability stack of the great four big trust drivers. And it's one of the most powerful parts of trust-based behavior. If you can be relied upon, then then you become a really important part of somebody's tribe. If you look around your tribe right now, I mean, I've got a tribe and my close friendship group is about five people, some of whom I love absolutely, but they are absolutely unreliable and I wouldn't expect them to be reliable. And there's two or three of them who are completely reliable. And the joke question that I have amongst my friendship group is, if you've killed someone and you've got a body to bury, who do you call? Um, and, uh, and you're always secretly pleased when one of your friends says, well, I call you. And you think, oh, yeah, I'd call you too. And sometimes you think, I wouldn't call you. You're just hopeless. But anyway, I still love you. So this concept of where you fit in a network, particularly for providing advice, if you can fit into the bucket of completely reliable, that trades away all sorts of other outcomes. You don't have to be a genius if you're reliable. You don't have to be hitting the best possible returns if you're reliable because reliability is absolutely critical, people, to particularly at times of stress. Who's part of the network that you can trust and through reliability, and reliability is a great interest in that at a time when it comes. So there's all sorts of clues to reliability, which is really important to understand. There's absolutely small clues. One of the great things that are, uh, that's going on at the moment, one of my, I have, a, I have a couple of advisors because I'm lucky enough to have Cordata in different countries around the world and I have an advisor in the UK. My advisor in the UK texts me on Wednesday every morning at 10 a.m. That's about 2 a.m. in, in, in sorry, it's 10 p.m. In, almost in Australia. And I get the text and I know it's an automated service because I helped him set it up, but it's a really intimate thing that I get from Philip every, every week on Wednesday saying, Hey, just touching base. This is what's happened over in the markets. This is what's going on. This is what we've done because we're technically in a managed account with him because even though they don't call it that over them, that's what's going on. It's really intimate because it's a text and it's, Hey, just touching base. This is just what, what you've done. And it's kind of pushed him into a really reliable spot in our brain. Um, Philip tends to text every Wednesday before 11 a.m. He, he tends to be respond by a text. He has a bunch of automated systems. Even if this automated system is saying I'm out of the office, I'm skiing, which is the last one I got from him. Um, I'll be, you know, I'll be back to you as quickly. Uh, I'll be back to you as quickly. In, in, in the meantime, I'm not at the office called Georgia. This is a telephone number. So he's really reliable on all those small things. And it tends to build up to a belief that the person who's reliable on a lot of small things is going to be reliable on the big things as well. 
So in the way that reliability works is that you tend to leave a bunch of clues. Um, uh, I'll give you an example of something which isn't reliable. I just um, had a meeting with someone that was supposed to be at 11 o'clock today and he was half an hour late. He wants me to provide a service to him, but I left after waiting for 20 minutes because I know what the future looks like with this guy. Everything's going to be half an hour late. Everything's going to be on his terms. He won't be forming a partnership with me. He'll be kind of exploiting the relationship. And if he's prepared to be half an hour late for a meeting, which he called and he organized, et cetera, et cetera, then the future is very uncertain. I mean, if he'd been 10 minutes late or even if he'd responded to a text and say, I'm stuck, I'm going to be half an hour late, any of those things would work. So I've literally given up business because I don't want to work with someone who's unreliable. It's just not worth it. And I know what the future looks like. It's such a critical indicator of what success is and what's going on. The really interesting bit, bit about this is there's a huge amount of evidence, and a lot of this evidence is really old, that you can build systems which make your process reliable. And if you build those systems, then your business becomes easy to work with, easy to buy, and easy to understand. And people with reliable systems have a much higher tolerance to price. So it's a, it's a quality for, it's a, it's an integer for quality and a quality is an integer for high price. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. And, uh, and obviously the, the opposite of, as you just mentioned, the, the opposite is, is unreliability. Um, now I wanted to ask you a little bit about this stacking of that reliability versus the stacking of unreliability. Cause it seems like you only have to be unreliable once or twice and that's the end of it. Whereas reliability can take more, more, more occasions. Well, it's a very interesting thing. So the, the minimum reliability equations is three, right? And this, this is actually something that the Greeks knew about, and they they called it the trust bank. You had to build deposits in the trust bank before you could ask a question of somebody. You had to build the right to ask for for, 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 for someone to support you. And they, they were literally talking about the ability to call on another tribe if they were attacked by somebody else. So they wanted to build a relationship with the Spartans or the Athenians or the Cretans or somebody else because they were constantly getting attacked by people, and they wanted to be able to go and say, hey, we need your help. You know, Philip of Macedon is coming down the coast and we need about 600 guys. Are you prepared to send 600 guys to, to, to die on the hill for us? And you had to build that reliability and that relationship because they needed to be able to call on you to be able to do the same thing. It's kind of part of reciprocity and, and it forms in the same thing. So none of this is new. And they said so that they, they prepared to have three positive integers before they were able to even ask the question. So before they were able to even go and say to them, Hey, we need 300 guys to, 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 to be able to deliver on this. There's so many great examples of that from history that it's not even fun. So minimum of three, but as many as possible. And then, of course, with the unreliability. Yeah, think of it as a, as a multiplier of three. So once you've had one bad experience, it's, you know, has the weight of three. I mean, you've got to go back. You've got to go back to the beginning. Yeah, you've got to start again and build it up again. And it's going to take years. And you're going to have to accept that you're going to have to you're going to have to give a lot away to build that reliability again. Uh, but, you know, it's a process. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking that you start with a – you probably start at a point of neutral, right? And then you've got to build three. And then, but if you get an unreliability, you go back into the yeah. negatives. Yeah. Um, McDonald's have a, a version of it which they tr- train into all their managers and they're probably the best in the world and they call it the trust bank. So they're constantly looking for making tr- uh, deposits in the trust bank. And they, it's a really interesting part because if you um, – if you look at that McDonald's training and I was watching it online because it's a bit of a cult and I was trying to understand how they do it and how they get people to basically give up a percentage of their income to build their property empire, which I thought this is really interesting, right? How these guys have convinced this, these guys to do it. And they're kind of, they're, they're constantly working at putting deposits in people's trust banks so that they can sort of do it and, and make sure those things happen. The really interesting part is that when people betray that trust, and the, and they give that trust away. We, and we tend to fumble it away in the advice industry. Let me give you an example of that. I think advisors do a lot for their clients and they don't tell them about it. They're constantly making adjustments, working on the systems and their processes and thinking about it and investing time in it. And they never ask for payment for that. So I think we've got to be able to sort of talk about that more. I think that the way Philip sends a message every Wednesday, literally telling me he's done something for me, builds deposits in that trust bank all the time and mimics that idea of reliability. He's actually quite a reliable person. He's an accountant um, by, by background and, and, and is very straightforward. But but making sure that you're constantly building those deposits is important. So if you're letting a year go past without building reliability deposits with your customers three or four to five to six times, then that's a bad thing. If you're not building that programmatically into the relationship, um, and then you're letting an opportunity going to go past. And if you're not actually being authentic about that reliability, then, well, you're literally a fraud. 
Yeah, exactly right. Now, uh, change is a big part of um, a process of any business and how does reliability and change work together or against each other? Yeah, that's a, that's really confronting because I don't work with businesses, but I'm watching a lot of um, advice businesses go through fundamental change in terms of process and doing all those things. Um, I think you have to be really candid that change is painful. Um, and that change, there is going to, there are going to be mistakes, mistakes made and things are going to be harder than they seem for a little while. So you have to be really careful about communicating change and what you're prepared to accept and to do a few other things. For example, um, we're just moving to taking some of the research that we do and turning it into short videos, explaining it to the customers so they don't actually have to read 300 pages of data. And we did, we recorded our first one last week and it was terrible. Um, uh, and uh, authentically terrible. Authentically, that's a hundred percent right. And yeah. I said to the team, "We know the first one's going to be terrible. We're just learning the process of how to do this. So let's do six before we start looking at quality. Let's just get the process right, get the editing right, and build up a process and improve, improve, improve it. So we've got to do six by the end of August. Um, I don't think they'll ever see the light of day. I certainly hope the first one never sees the light of day because I was on the person on the video. But the reality is that we've got to build the process right. We, then we can make it reliable and then we can actually do, do it at scale before we go anywhere. So, I mean, I know everyone was disappointed with the first one, but that's not the point. The point is to go through the process to get it right and work on doing six before we start looking at quality. Yeah. Um, that's true of everyone going through change you know, and you have to be able to communicate that really clearly. This is going to hurt but it's better for us and it's really important. So you've hit on something that I haven't really thought about a lot, but it's certainly true that as a species, we're addicted to transformation, right? And transformation is a really important part of who we are. We're transforming our businesses. We're transforming ourselves. We're transforming our customers' lives. And we have to be really clear about that and do it authentically and reliably. And when we're doing things which are causing change, we have to acknowledge the pain, acknowledge the time, and acknowledge that it's not going to be perfect and that that imperfection will increase over time. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think you should uh, release those videos just by the way because um, it, that, that then creates a bit of a uh, a bit of an anchor for the uh, for the rest of the videos as, as they get better. I've, I've learned something about myself doing this, Fraser. I learned that uh, uh, what I look good in is the past and the dark. <laughs> hey. I love, I love the comment, uh, just off topic that everybody says that, uh, you know, they were here as a photo of me when I was younger, as opposed to every other photo of them. Yeah. No one really wants to. Because you don't have it when you're older. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for chatting to us about uh, reliability. I look forward to catching you in the next episode when we really start talking about the, the feeling that somebody is acting in your best interest. I'm looking forward to it. Jane, thank you for coming back to us and talking about reliability. Welcome back to the conversation. Hi, Fraser. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Now, tell us a little bit about some of the uh, behaviours within your business uh, around reliability and how um, reliability is something that uh, builds trust. Uh, Look, I um, really communicate with the clients that if if there's something they want to talk to me about, if there's a question they've got and and it's 10 o'clock at night, I'm happy for them to shoot me a text or send me an email because I don't have the notifications up on my phone because they then say, I don't want to wake you up or I don't want to disturb you. And I explain I don't have the notifications to ding on my phone. Um, So it's important that they can feel that they can tap into to my knowledge or to, to tap into their relationship with me you know, if they've got a question or there's something that worries them, if it's if it's stopping them from sleeping, I'm happy for them to shoot the information through to me and um, and that, you know, I can look at that, look at the message, look at the email, answer the phone call and uh, and come back to them with, with an answer, with a response. I think that's important. Um, and it's important to set expectations and timelines. Obviously, in regional you know, in regional New South Wales when I'm going from one place to another, you know, I might go and see some clients that are three hours away. And then if we're talking about if it's a new client or even an existing client and we're looking at maybe doing some changes, that's going to take me some time to get back up to the office, um, to, to have all of, you know, go through our compliance steps, make sure that, that we're um, that we're doing everything that we need to be doing and and, and to come back and provide some advice on that. So, you know, I might say to some people, it's been six weeks before I'm back in front of you and these are the reasons why. I think it's important that you explain if it's about reliability and it's a short period of time or it's a long period of time, this is why I can and can't do that. So I think 
um, setting that timeline um, out. And obviously, you know, COVID did slow a lot of things down uh, for a lot of people in different ways. So it's about going back and saying, look, I know potentially initially it was this timeline, but you know, it's going to be this because we're still waiting on this answer. Or so I think it's just communicating that that information about about that. Yeah, so really, really leaning into the communicating the setting of expectations, I guess, and and allowing that uh, people have got that expectation of one thing, and then you know, you're I guess you you're trying to out out deliver what you talk, talk to them about. Yeah, that's right. And look, you know, um, recently I um I sort of had a had a bit of a a hurdle. My um my sister passed away unexpectedly about six weeks ago. So that sort of threw threw me out a little bit in, in lots of ways and um, so it was important that I just went back to to some people and said look this is what's happened I just need to make you aware of what's happened we're going to have to reset that timeline and of course everyone was very um, very understanding and, and sympathetic about it which is very nice um, and that then goes back into our previous conversation about showing vulnerability you know that as an advisor and a professional and someone that's running a business, there are all these glass balls that we're that we're juggling and and not wanting to drop, and it's about showing that you're not superhuman. That you uh, you know you can go back to them and say, look, this has happened, and then you know a week later I got COVID, so that sort of threw me out a little bit again. So you just go and you you communicate that information that this is what's happened, this is what we're looking at for a timeline, and people are completely fine about that. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, obviously, reliability. We think about showing up every single time, but uh, you know, it's not always about that. It's about saying, leaning into the concept that if you can't, um, you're going to get in front of that and say, you know, show your vulnerability and and and, and reset the expectations. Um, tell me a little bit about the uh, the reliability piece over time. You know, like building trust over time and how those relationships develop. Look, um, I've always had. The philosophy that trust is earned, it shouldn't be demanded and it shouldn't be expected. You know, it takes time to build trust. So, and that's something that I always, um, with new clients, I'm explaining to them that this is a, a two-way street when we're um, when we're meeting and, you know, they're sort of interviewing me to see if I'm the right advisor for them and I'm interviewing them to see if, if they're the sort of client that fits into my space that you know, we're going to gel well. And so I think that setting that expectation, setting um, all of all of the information out on the table is very important. And um, trust is earned over time. And I, I have clients who will outright say, yes, I trust you. And I say, that's really great, but I still need you to explain understand I'm going to explain what we're doing because at the end of the day this is your money this is your pathway I'm just here walking along with you holding your hand so um, that's a it's a lovely compliment but in in the same sense they still need to have an absolute understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing that and so I continue to repeat those conversations over and over with the clients year after year or uh, appointment after appointment because that is what's important. And um, it's also about me trying to gain an understanding into what they think and how they work and how they manage their money because it may be, for example, that I'm managing their superannuation and an investment portfolio, for example, and and maybe some insurance that we've done over a period of time and we're continuing to to rejig that. But I also want to understand how they manage their day-to-day money. And if they don't need my help, that's fine. I don't, you know, I don't push myself into that space. But if I get a sense that someone is potentially not managing their cash flow as well, I will um, just continue to encourage them to lean on me if they need help in that space because we can make success and great results out of some of this these other places with the superannuation and the investments but if they feel day to day that their money is that they're not managing their money well and they don't really they don't know where to turn to or they don't know how to ask or they they feel that they should know and they don't know enough that's important that um, 
I can gain their trust so that we can actually get a handle on that because if you're not managing that day-to-day -day money well, that can be quite stressful and it's an unnecessary stress. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, such, a, such a big part of it. Jane, thank you for being part of this uh, particular episode. I look forward to catching you in the next one and really getting a little bit deeper into that concept of acting in somebody's or the feeling that somebody is acting in, the, in your best interest. Thanks, Fraser. Anthony, welcome back to this third episode. Thank you. Now, we are tackling the concept of reliability in this episode. Tell us a little bit about, uh, obviously, your, you know, your business is 40-odd 40, 40 years old and uh, you've been there for half of that. Tell us a little bit about what rely, reliability means uh, to you and your business. Um, well, I think the most important thing is always being there for clients when they need us. Um, that's probably the, the number one thing because that's, that's, I guess, why we operate. That's what we're here for. Um, I'm a stickler for being on time. Um, so, and when we sort of turn up to, um, you know, if I turn up to a client's house, I'm, I'm, I'm visiting them. Um, I'm probably one of these people. I'd be half an hour early rather than one minute late. So, you know, I might sit out, but I'll, I'll also not go in early as well. That can be just as much inconvenience being five minutes early. Um, you know, they might be finishing dinner or, you know, kids to bed or whatever that, you know, you might be doing. So, you know, use, you can use that time to, you know, call someone else or, or do something else. Um, but I think, you know, being on time and, and, you know, if you say I'm going to be there at such and such, that sort of demonstrates that reliability. I've had a number of people say almost open the door right at, you know, nine o'clock or something as you're walking um, sort of up the stairs. So um, I think that's that's a really important thing um, that we can do for people. So, um, but I think also too, when you get through that, you know, going through the process, I think when sort of clearly explaining to the person the different steps are going to happen, the time frame it's going to take for that to happen, and then delivering on it. Um, you know, the number one thing we, we hear from clients that, you know, may have had another advisor in the past is, oh, we never heard from them. Um, you know, we didn't know what was happening. Um, we rang up three months later and they said, oh, oh, yeah, no, we haven't done this yet or done that. And I think that just puts people off. I know for ourselves, I mean, we just got some little bit of work done at home um, on a wall and, you know, this was the best tradesman I think we've ever had. He, they turned up. You didn't even know they were there after they left at the end of the day. Um, they turned up on time every morning. Um, they actually rang to say, hey, we're, we're here. Absolutely incredible, which is not something you always talk about with a with a tradesperson. Um, and I think, you know, relaying that back to sort of we need to be the same. We need to be that person that was reliable. We always get back to clients within 24 hours. You can always talk to someone in our office, not a machine. So I think they're really, really important things to instill confidence because there's nothing worse than ringing, leaving a message, and then the next minute you're saying, well, I wonder if they've actually got that message. Yeah, the confidence thing is really interesting, isn't it? I, I like the idea of always turning up early and then you know, really setting yourself up, uh, taking that moment to set, right, right what am I, I going to do here, what the meeting is, you know, maybe getting, getting yourself prepped for the meeting. Um, and, you know, obviously, yes, doing what you say you're going to do and, you know, and having those things. Communication is a big part of that, isn't it? Just making sure you've got a, a decent communication system. Absolutely. And it's it's a case of and, – and communication to me, and I think where um, a lot of – well, maybe not so much newer advisors but younger advisors that we've had through the place have fallen down is that um, I keep saying an email is not a relationship-building exercise. Um, just because you've emailed someone doesn't mean you've actually done the job. Um, ring them. Um, you need to use the phone. You need that personal communication. And again, um, a quick phone call can often save, you know, a lot of time. Um, and it also gives you that opportunity just to, to have a chat to someone. Is there anything, you know, what's happening, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so I think that's that to me is the absolute key. Um, you know, we all get so many emails, but, you know, it, there's nothing like getting a phone call. Um, you know, I think you respond a lot more positively to a phone call these days. This is probably unusual. It's unusual, you know, not to have to push 15 buttons to actually get through to someone. Or um, So, you know, from that point of view, we're just trying to give people, I guess, the old-fashioned experience where you'd actually turn up or you'd speak to someone, you know, the prior to emails and those sorts of things. So It's funny, isn't it? Emails have sort of lost their personality. Well, I think you get so many now that it's it's – uh, I think it makes us less efficient. Um, as much as it's 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 good when it were when you need it, um, but it's terribly inefficient. Um, and I always said, if we could, with our advisors, if we could get rid of the emails, life would be you know they'd have better relationships with clients. Clients would be happier. Everything would be great. Um, yeah. I mean, I often 
you know, and I think one of the, the key things that, that we often do, um, and it's a good way to get referrals without actually asking is, you know, if I'm driving for, to an appointment um, and people say, oh, why do you know, we only have clients come to our office, why do you go and see them? Well, I actually use the time in the car. I actually have a list of clients and I just ring some randomly from time to time just to say hello. And the, probably the last two I've rang in the last, well, probably, you know, say a month ago um, or so, both of them said, oh, I'm glad you actually rang because I've just been thinking, I've just been talking to my sister or such and such, they need to find a financial advisor. So, you know, using that time just to ring someone without any requirement, um, you know, from that point of view, you know, is worth its weight in gold as well. So, Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for being on this particular episode. I look forward to catching you in the final episode. Great, thanks. And folks, thank you for joining me again. Fraser. Good to see you. <laughs> Good, Good to, see, to you. see you, sir. We're in, we're in, we're recording in real life. Um, look, we're here to talk about uh, reliability in this particular episode of our series of building the art of building trust. Mm. Uh, talk to uh, talk to me a little bit about how um, uh, how important is reliability and being able to show up when you say you're going to show up. It's the basic, isn't it? Right? Like nobody. So I, I always joke uh, here at work. Um, I don't like surprises unless they involve a Zimmerman dress and a bottle of Verv. <laughs> so, uh, otherwise, and our members certainly don't appreciate surprises when it comes to administration, investment performance, and the like. And I know we did some research recently where I think it was, it was close to sixty-five percent of our members said really their super fun most important thing is that security and reliability um, and that it's their money is safe. Yeah, really interesting word, yeah. safe, isn't it? Um, yeah. Because often uh, we're talking about growing money, uh, but we're talking about uh, safe is the number one priority. And you can see that in the behaviour when markets, you know, when markets are going up so much, people go, oh, they sort of just trottle along, not thinking, but you advisors know, and we saw it, you know, we've seen it so much in recent years, and I think we're going to really face into it in um, the next couple of years with the investment climate we might be heading into, is the, the moment that they – uh, see something on their news and they think their money's not safe, they get really nervous, which is why this trust factor of I trust my advisor to uh, act in my best interest. So we, um, in that research we did, 82% of the um, members that we researched said that is the fundamentally the most important thing and then that that money is safe. Yep. And so, um, you know, they work really hard. If you think about it, you're, you work hard, I work hard, SG's going in, you're, it, it, you know, and so it's really precious and they just worry about it vanishing. And so the institution where the money's invested is equally as important as the advisor. The advisor's going to look after it and the, and the, where they've invested that money is also safe. Yep. Yep. And, and what are, what are some of the ways that we can, as an advisor, start building rely, that reliability or building that trust? We've spoken about it in the other episodes, isn't it? It's around transparency. It's around, talking their language, not using the jargon, making sure um, informed consent and understanding is something obviously advisors as we become a pre- pre- profession talk about a lot. But we, if you do that really well, that's going to create an environment when markets do tank that hopefully the advisor is not fielding phone calls because the client's second guessing because they didn't really understand in the first place. They really do know and trust um, because they understand and that is that transparency factor. Yep. Yep. Show up and keep showing up. Yeah. And, and, it's so, yeah, yeah. And it's the simple things. If someone says they're going to, I'm going to call you, I'm going to email you. And then they don't. Firstly, you know, the first time maybe there's some understanding or something might have gone wrong. Then the next time there's a trend. I'm disappointed. They let me. And then eventually there is just, Oh, this person, I don't trust that. That word's not good for anything. And so it's really the simple things. Um, uh, and getting them right. Yeah. Now I want to talk. I want to talk about the concept of you know like um, uh, businesses having years of experience. For example, uh, we, we've talked a little bit in the past about the re, the rebranding or the two businesses coming together. Yeah. Um, and then and for those advisors that might be in a long established business, that's probably easier to start demonstrating that long term reliability. But for new businesses, it's difficult. You guys have been through a rebrand where you've we starting a new brand, I guess. Tell us about, um, you know, the idea of reliability and how you bring those two together to, to forward into the new brand. And I think, yeah, that's a good question because between the two funds, there's 140 years of history um, there. But if you've seen the new ad, uh, Big Baby comes out because it's the, you know, there's we can start afresh. And I think if you're a, a practitioner, if you're a young advisor starting in an established firm, you can, again, play that. Well, I'm I am new, but I'm in this established infrastructure with the, with the systems and processes in place. But equally, I know some great advisors that have um, been employed for 
big institutions and advisors that have gone out on their own. It was super exciting. Um, so they don't necessarily have all the infrastructure, but they can demonstrate they've already got that rel- – they, they ooze an authenticity, which we've spoken about, and a confidence and uh, that lack of pretense in how they communicate. So in, I, I feel like the – you know, proving the reliability isn't required because their bedside manner is um, just oozes, you know, gives the client confidence. This person knows what they're talking about. Yep. And we talked about authenticity before. And, and uh, I think if you are authentic to yourself, then you can create that consistency of, of, of who you are than having to try and, and keep, keep yeah, doing something. And not trying you. to be everything to everyone. So I, I think the advisors that I, um, and I speak, I've spoken about them a lot, um, who inspire me, just have a real clarity around, I can't be everything to everyone. Because if you try to be everything to everyone, you're going to inevitably fail and those systems will not be reliable. So having a turnkey approach to, look, I um, I work best with people who are in, like there are firms that specialise in public service, Queensland government. There are firms that specialise in you know, a particular mining company out in the region and they just know everything about that, that the client or prospective client. So again, it just makes sure that some they they know what they're talking about. They can demonstrate that knowledge. They can demonstrate they'll be acting in the client's best interest, and um, and it just creates that safe environment so the client's not feeling worried. Yeah, I feel like the advisors you're talking about are the ones that can that know what's happening to the client before the client knows. Well, that's that's perf- That's perfection, isn't it? So you know, we're thinking about in terms of what we do next, and how can we um, develop our system so we can help the advisors tell them what's happening in their client portfolios before anyone so that they can get ahead of it. Um, you know, it's super funds haven't uh, historically worked with financial advisors really well. Super funds always, you know, the industry funds have been an employer member dynamic. But I think recognising that these external financial advisors actually have the trust it's the members that trust them. And we just see year upon year and more and more people looking to, and these are again, or not wealth, you know, they're not high net worth people, but they're paying three grand, four grand, you know, for retirement planning advice because they trust this person. Because, and, and that trust is something that's got to be respected and we've got to honour that. And thanks for so much for joining us in this episode. We speak about reliability. Let's, uh, let's catch up on the next episode when we're talking about at the feeling that clients get when someone is acting in their best interest. What a beautiful idea. Let's do that. Mm-hmm.